And we are now live. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I believe we are still waiting on one member to have a quorum. Thanks, Val. I was just, just checking that. Are we wait on Larry. Okay. Looks like we've got it, Val. Okay. All right. <clears throat> um, I'm going to call the Planning Commission for May 25th, 2021 to order. Um, the uh, item number two is the approval of the agenda. Are we voting on this now, Val? Um, let's do a roll call first, and okay. then we can do the agenda. Okay. Um, let's all well, I will start. Let's see. Chair Yader. Commissioner Anderson. Yes, I am here and <laughs> unmuted. Vice Chair Briscoe. Present. Commissioner Franzen. Here. Commissioner Maudlin. Here. Commissioner Romulo. Commissioner Schulte. Okay. And then number two, Val, are we, is this uh, just for a point of order, are, are we approving uh, the agenda via vote? Yes, yes. Okay. Mr. Chair, I move that we accept the agenda as presented today. I have a motion. And a I will second. Okay, a motion and a second. Val, please call the roll. Yes, Vice Chair Briscoe. Aye. Commissioner Anderson? Aye. Commissioner Franzen? Aye. Commissioner Maudlin? Aye. Okay. Agenda is approved. Item number three is a public hearing to consider a request for a use by special review to allow for a multifamily dwelling containing up to four units on approximately 0.22 acres in the commercial high intensity zone district. Project is 1021 Fifth Street, Multifamily USR, case number USR 2019-0014. The applicant is Scott Golden, location as 1021 Fifth Street, and the presenter is Mr. Jackson. Thank you, good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, Vice Chair Briscoe, can you give me a thumbs up that the slides are okay? Thank you. So the site is located north of Fifth Street between 10th Avenue and 11th Avenue. In 1885, the dwelling was constructed on the site. The current zoning is commercial high intensity and the current use is as a two family dwelling. In 2019, uh, the applicant submitted a USR application for four units and went through some iterations over time and is bringing the uh, current proposal to you today. Here's a couple of photos of the site, the one on the left looking at the site from Fifth Street and the photo on the right looking at the site from the alley. Looking at the surroundings a little bit, so the north is zoned residential medium density, and there's a couple of small laneway houses along the alley back there. Looking to the east, the zoning is commercial high intensity with single family, family dwelling. Looking to the south, you can see Fifth Street zoning residential medium use single family dwelling. And looking to the west is zone commercial high intensity and has a multifamily dwelling, uh, just a house that has been converted into multiple units. So the proposed USR that you saw in your packet includes a proposed fourplex, uh, so multifamily up to four units. Two of the units would face Fifth Street, and then two of the units would face North. The applicant is also proposing a four-car carport on the north side with four tandem spaces behind it. This would also allow for parking along Fifth Street. 
the approval criteria from the development code related to looking at use by special review applications. Uh, staff believes that it is consistent with the comprehensive plan, including the strategic housing plan and the land use guidance map, as well as a number of objectives shown on your screen from the Imagine Greeley comp plan. Staff also believes that it's compatible with the area in terms of the use, architecture, parking setbacks, and building size. The use can be uh, physically, physically uh, constructed on the site. The site can accommodate the proposed development and no adverse impacts on traffic or parking are anticipated. Also no uh, identified cumulative impacts of USRs in the area. 73 landowners within 500 feet of the property were notified and a sign was posted at the property. It was noticed in the newspaper and staff received no inquiries. The applicant did address all of staff comments and staff recommends approval of the request. This concludes staff's presentation. Uh, moving forward, we'll take any questions of staff and then the applicant and then uh, open it up to public hearing. Uh, okay. Caleb, just, just a Go quick ahead, question as far as, um, you know, we've, we've seen this in the housing presentations that we've sat in previously with, with Lane House, and this isn't a Lane House, but um, is the USR for a, a four, four unit dwelling over there, um, is it only allowed two units in this current situation or, or why the USR? So all residential development in this commercial high zoning district require a use by special review. Okay, thank you. So my question is, uh, how did this land acquire the commercial high intensity zoning when clearly it's surrounded by residences? And why does zoning it residential not make sense? Yeah, so I think that possibly zoning residential could make sense. However, that requires additional processing uh, that goes to city council as well. Um, so in the commercial high zoning district, um, you know, residential uses are anticipated um, in certain cases. And so that's why that use by special review uh, criteria is there um, to allow them in certain cases. And staff believes that this is a case where it does make sense. So it's just more expedient for so, the developer to pursue a USR instead of rezone? That's part of it. Um, but also, yeah, the existing commercial high intensity zoning um, has been there for quite some time. There could have been intentions at one time to redevelop that whole corner into commercial, but that has not materialized. So uh, this application is looking to uh, you know, obviously make some improvements to the site and the neighborhood um, that staff supports. Yeah, I'm just curious because it looks like it's been residential for a hundred years. Uh, what, what would have caused the city to rezone it commercial high intensity or to label it as such when it was originally zoned? Do we, do we have a narrative, a history on how it was acquired this zoning in the first place? Yeah, the only thing I could speculate there is it is near the intersection of two arterial roadways. And so oftentimes we'll, you know, have those areas zoned to commercial to allow for that type of development. Um, but I don't have the, the history. I can understand of, that with Greenfield, it just seems strange that for obviously residential area to have been zoned commercial high intensity. It's, it's a curious, curious uh, zoning. If you're overlaying a zoning onto what exists, it seems odd that someone would have chosen high intensity commercial all the way yeah, it might block. be one of those zoning mismatched areas that we come to you quite a bit with. Yeah, <laughs> okay. So, thank you. Any other questions, Larry? No, not at this okay. time. All right. Um, thanks, Caleb. Um, if the applicant is available and wishing to speak, they can do so at this time. They would. Doesn't appear so. All right, this is a public hearing. <clears throat> and so anyone wishing to speak can do so. You can use the uh, raise hand function at the bottom of the Zoom meeting here um, or the chat. Now, do we have any input? I am not seeing any emails. Um, 
Nothing in the chat or the q and I'm not seeing anything. Okay. I do, um, Vice Chair Briscoe, we do have someone in attendance, Clarence Lopez, that had raised his hand. Clarence, if you would like to accept the request to speak, you're welcome to. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm the uh, property owner of the that corner lot, those two properties that have, zoned, have been zoned high density commercial. It's 422 11th Avenue. That's the corner lot between the two arterials, 11th Avenue and 5th Street. I have that corner lot. And then I have 1027 5th Street. It's a uh, two story that's been converted to three units. And I can kind of go back to answer that question that I think uh, one of you had as far as the history goes of that, of that area. I live at 1018 Fifth Street, which is across the street uh, from almost directly across the street from the property that's going, that they're looking to rezone. So there was at one point in time where that whole area was zoned residential, low density residential. And I'm not sure if it was back in, 80s when the city of Greeley was looking at building the uh, Greeley Police Department on that same block that this property owner wants to re uh, develop. And so it was rezoned from single family R1, low density residential to, I'm not sure what, the, what they rezoned it to, but that was an anticipation of the city of Greeley. Um, their future plans were to build the Greeley Police Department on that block. And that didn't materialize. And of course they moved out to West 10th Street. And I think at that point in time, they rezoned, they went back to the, uh, was it RM medium, medium family residential. And so we went back to a residential designation, but the two properties I owned uh, have been commercial for, for a long time. So, but the rest of the block, they rezoned it back to residential. So that's just a little bit of the history that I know of. Uh, when it went from residential to commercial back to residential. Uh, and so I'm just, my question is that if uh, it seems like the only access that those units are going to have behind 1021 Fifth Street is that alley, alley access. So we're going to have lots of traffic pouring on 11th Avenue from that alley at that point. So I'm fine with that, but I, I guess my biggest concern is that with the development of those units back there, is it going to is it going to hinder my future development as far as commercial, something commercial might go? So I want to do a commercial development there. Okay, thank you, Mr. Lopez. Anybody else, April? At this time, I do not see anyone else using the raise hand feature. Thank you. Okay. And I'm going to close the um, public portion of this hearing and um, turn it back to the commission. Caleb, do you do you want to uh, speak to Mr. Lopez's question about parking? I see I see the site plan here, but I think that you probably have the background. Yeah, so uh, the parking is just proposed off of the alley. Uh, they have that correct. That would eliminate the driveway accessing onto Fifth Street. So helping improve traffic flow along Fifth Street and allow additional parking on that Fifth Street curb. Um, but the access would be off of, of the alley for vehicular traffic. In terms of impacts to developing the neighboring site as commercial, uh, it wouldn't have uh, much impact on, on the developability of the neighboring side at all. Okay. And this is just four units, correct? That's correct. Okay. Commission, I'll turn it back to you guys for action or discussion. Uh, I have the motion up. I can make the motion. That'd be great, Mr. thanks. Vice Chair. Uh, Based on the application received and the preceding analysis, the Planning Commission finds that the proposed use by special review for a multifamily dwelling with up to four units in the commercial high intensity zone district is consistent with the development code criteria in section 24-480 and therefore approves the use by special review. I have a motion. Can I I'll a second. second that motion. All right, we have a motion and a second. 
Looks like we've got no discussion on this. So Val, please call the vote. Vice well, the, Chair. The only, oh, I was just going to say the, the, the only discussion that I, I, I would think of to, to um, assuage the uh, property owner there is, is that making the alley one way would solve his problem. So if it were to be one way from west to east, eastbound, then the people coming and going, causing a traffic mix up at 11th Avenue, access to the commercial corner would be solved. So, and I'm sure the planners could come up with something like that. So anyway, I'm ready to vote. Okay. Vice Chair Briscoe. Aye. Commissioner Anderson. Aye. <clears throat> Commissioner Franzen. Aye. Commissioner Maudlin. Aye. Motion carries. Okay, um, item four is a public hearing to consider a request for a use by special review to allow for a 224 unit apartment complex on approximately 8.91 acres in the commercial high intensity zone district. The project is the Copper Platte Apartments USR, case number USR 2020-0006. The applicant is Robert Kettner of the Inland Group. Location is 1750 Greeley Mall Street, and the presenter is Ms. Stoller. Thank you. Good afternoon. And can you, um, Eric, confirm you're able to see my slides all right? Thank you. All right. As stated, this presentation is regarding a use by special review for a residential apartment complex in the commercial high intensity zone district. This slide provides an overview of the subject site and the surrounding area. The site is made up of two parcels outlined in black here, and they are split um, by one of the access drives to the Greeley Mall. So it's generally located south of Highway 34 bypass and west of 17th Avenue. It is located in the redevelopment district and the surrounding uses include retail and multifamily housing. So the top photo here shows the area to the north of the subject site, looking across Highway 34 bike pass. And the bottom photo shows the area to the east across 17th Avenue. The photos on the right on this slide highlight the area directly south of the subject site. And the photos on the right showcase the existing retail to the west. As previously stated, the applicant intends to construct a multifamily apartment complex on the subject site. The existing underutilized commercial buildings, which are shown on the slide here, would be demolished in order to construct the development. The applicant has proposed the project as an affordable housing project that would target households with income of no more than 60% of the area median income. Here you can see the site plan. The applicant is proposing eight four-story apartment buildings with a total of 224 units. Five of the buildings would be located on the northern parcel, and then the remaining three would be on the southern parcel, as well as the clubhouse. The residential units would be comprised of a combination of one, two, three, and four bedroom units, and a total of 404 parking stalls would be provided. It's a combination of surface, carport, and garage spaces. Carports would be situated at the north here, as well as two down on the southern parcel. And you can see one garage on the southern parcel and the remainder are up here on the north. So for recreational amenities, um, properties that are within the redevelopment district have the option to reduce their required open space by up to 2% for every recreational amenity that is provided. The applicant is proposing nine credits in total, which reduces their required open space from 20% to 2%. And this in turn reduces their required usable open space, which normally needs to be half of the required open space um, usable open space is defined as area available for recreational use or leisure activities. So it needs to be kind of a large enough size for people to congregate in, typically 6,000 square feet minimum. Um, so they are reducing the usable open space to 1%. However, the overall open space on the site is actually going to exceed what would typically be required 
And that standard was typically 20% and they would have 31% open space. So here you can see the landscape plan. Again, despite the fact that the required open space for the project was substantially reduced based on extra amenities, the site would be well landscaped. There would be a buckery yard provided along Highway 34 bypass to the north, as well as between the subject site and the existing neighboring commercial uses. There would also be perimeter landscaping along 17th Avenue, and the access drive to the mall would have enhanced landscaping provided um, to enhance the pedestrian experience. So here you can see the proposed building elevations. Again, they would be four stories tall and utilize three primary building materials, woodblock siding, architectural board and batten siding, and stone veneer siding. There are three different color schemes proposed and six different building types. I will note that the staff report incorrectly indicates there are only four building types. So that was an error. Um, the elevations shown here are for building type three. They showcase the front and rear of the structure. Um, other elevations were included in the agenda packet for reference. Each unit would include a covered balcony and that results in that varied roof line you can see. The maximum structure height varies um, by a few inches between the different building types. However, the tallest measure is going to be 41 and a half feet. Um, there was also a typo on one of the elevation sheets indicating that it would be taller than this for building type one. However, it is um, also going to be at that max 41 and a half feet. So here you can see the end elevations for that same building. The clubhouse and garages are gonna have similar colors and architecture and the carports would be constructed of pre-finished metal. The applicant did submit an alternative compliance request to increase the building height. Typically the CH zone has a maximum height of 40 feet. So they, based on the um, unusual layout of the site and it being an infill project, proposed an increase of one and a half feet um, to make it work with all the parking recreational requirements and whatnot. They also submitted a parking reduction request to reduce the overall parking required by 10%. And again, as an infill site, they qualify um, for this request being in the redevelopment district and staff felt that request is reasonable based on the fact that the area is well served by public transit. The Greeley um, Evans Transit Center has a mall station on the other side of the mall property on 23rd Avenue that has access to five different bus routes. So both of these requests have already been approved by the Community Development Director. Moving on to the USR approval criteria. It is consistent with a number of comprehensive plan objectives and supports the strategic housing plan as an affordable housing project. The use is compatible with the area. High density is encouraged along existing transit routes and staff does not expect an adverse impact to area traffic or a negative cumulative impact from other USRs in the area. We did hold a virtual neighborhood meeting for this project on May 12th, which was attended by five neighboring residents. Their questions pertain to which buildings were gonna be demolished and um, how the low income project might affect the community. And we provided proper noticing for this public hearing, but did not receive any additional citizen inquiries ahead of it. Therefore, staff recommends approval of their request and the suggested motion is shown for reference. Here's a reminder of the public hearing procedure moving forward. I would now be happy to take any questions. Kira, any questions for staff? I'm curious what the proposed development for the mall is intended to be. So for the mall property overall? Yes. Um, I think that's very much up in the air still. It's going to depend upon um, kind of the ownership. I think right now there's a few different parcels that are not all under the same ownership. So it's a little bit difficult to come up with one um, shared vision for the overall site. 
um, when not everyone's necessarily interested in coming forward at the same time to propose something. So it's definitely something that the city is wanting to pay close attention to. And I think we all feel that this project can kind of potentially help them all transition somewhat. Um, but again, it's kind of something that we don't have a lot of control over at this point in time. Is this considered to be kind of a pace setter for, for at least a direction the city would like to see the development go? Yeah, that's kind of the, the goal is to get something started and then see what more can come after the fact. Thank you. Yeah. Does the light that comes on to 34 bypass, will that get reconfigured for sequencing for heavy traffic? when the people leave to go to work? So I do know that a traffic study was conducted for the project um, based on the analysis we received, the level of service um, is currently a level C and it is not anticipated that this project would um, change the level of service that it's currently operating at. I think originally because the area was designed for more commercial traffic, which was gonna be a lot higher. Um, that's because they're now transitioning to this um, residential use, it's actually predicted to be lower than what it would be if all those commercial um, buildings on the site were in use. So we do not see the need for any changes at this time. Well, the school's gone too. Yeah. Does 17th Street allow for a, a longer uh, turning lane to go west out of that street as the traffic increases there? So I believe that's something that will be evaluated in the future, um, the potential need for that. But again, it's not triggered by this project. Thank you. Yep. Commissioner Anderson, did you have something? Oh, I was uh, just, um, I was wondering how it's unusual to have the, the poor little um, sort of orphaned auto zone there. Um, they are maintaining access to that. Um, but yeah, I think just because of how those parcels were kind of carved out, um, it's hard to avoid getting it kind of stuck in the corner where it's at. And based on being next to the highway, and the arterial road, um, they don't have the ability to get their own direct access onto the neighboring roadways, so. Right, um, are, are they here to comment? I am not sure whether anyone from the AutoZone is present today. Okay, thank you. From a business standpoint, I would think they'd be excited about having 400 cars in their parking lot <laughs> every day. Um. <laughs> here, what's, in the past, the commission has seen, um, improvements to the 23rd and 34th, 35th, and then 47th interchanges. Mm -hmm. What What is the, do, is there any, as it relates to this project and the traffic that we've talked about, is there any timeline on the 23rd improvement? I'm not aware of anything. I do believe um, Dylan from ADR is on the call as well. I don't know if you recall anything specific to that either, Dylan. Uh, no, Kara, I'm not aware of anything, but I can, this project doesn't trigger a CDOT uh, access permit because it's under the 20% increase of traffic. It's about, it's about anticipated to be a 10.1% increase. So it doesn't really affect the traffic as, you know, it's it, that uh, rate. It doesn't even trigger the permit. Cool. Okay. All right. Any other questions for staff? And I do believe the applicant is here um, if you had questions for them as well. Okay. If the applicant is here, April, can you help the applicant? Um, if they would like to come forward, please state your name and address for the record. And um... uh, Yeah, <clears throat> good afternoon. Keith James with the Inland Group, um, uh, 120 West Cataldo Avenue, Spokane, Washington, 99. Um, 201. Um, really have very little comments, mostly just want to make ourselves available to answer any questions. Um, I will uh, throw out just two bits of information, uh, one of which when we came across this site, 
Gosh, I guess about nine or almost 10 months ago now, um, we, we started with the city's Department of Economic Health and Housing and really wanted to make sure between that department and the planning department that there was a clear path forward here. It was, it was fairly obvious to us that redevelopment was going to occur. Um, these out parcels to the mall were the obvious first, first steps. Um, you know, who knows what the mall will be two decades from now, but we, we believe it will be either strengthened as a commercial center or considerably redeveloped. So um, I just wanted to note that we got great support from um, economic health and housing initially, um, and, and they still are supportive today. Um, and really the second thing I wanted to mention was just to Commissioner Anderson's point. Um, it is a little awkward. Um, the site is awkward with the split mall or the split, uh, the split site with the entry to the mall and with the auto zone. Um, we have been in touch with all of those. Uh, there's actually three surrounding owners um, and, and actually need their approval of some title documents, reciprocal easement agreement, reciprocal easement agreements. Um, and so the, those relationships are very strong. Um, we've worked with AutoZone um, collaboratively and cooperatively to, to reach a site plan um, that, that works for us and them. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll leave it and just be available for any questions. Thank you. Any questions for the applicant? No question, just a comment. I think this is a great, great plan and um, I'm excited to see see what this comes to fruition or not over there. So very creative. All right. Thank you, Mr. James. This is a public hearing. And so anyone um, wishing to speak can do so at this time. April, do we have anybody that wants to speak about this issue? Yes, we do have a live attendee that would like to make a comment. Samantha? Will you please accept the request? Yes, hi. Hi, Samantha. <clears throat> if you would state your name and address for the record and you'll have three minutes. Okay, Samantha Camps, 2830 16th Avenue. It's actually under Samantha Mintz. And my concern is actually came up during your meeting today is with the traffic um, at like Larry talked about, the traffic actually is is really st stacking up over here, as is now. And so, if you add four hundred cars, maybe they all won't come out on this on this east end. But the traffic, especially during high high peak hours, already stacks clear back up over the hill. And there's only that short block that they're supposed to get into the right turn lane, but they don't. They start ahead of that. As soon as the cars that are parked there, they get over into that right lane and they cross and they block that our road to get out of there. And it's it's pretty pretty um con it's pretty congested now. So I'm kind of surprised they say there is no impact to the traffic. Okay. Thank you, Samantha. Anyone else, April? At this time, I do not see any other live attendees, any questions in the chat or in the, que or in the question and answer. Um, Valerie? Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, can you hear me? I can. Okay, my video is has punked out on me. So I'm just, I do have an email from Benjamin Snow, who is the director of economic health and housing. And he just comments, uh, he's got four comments. Uh, at home has re relocated to Johnstown near Highway 34 and I-25 near Shields. Economic health and housing supports this project as a highly, cons as highly consistent with the SHP in that it leverages a key infill site, oh, strategic housing plan, I assume, and develops much needed affordable housing units. Number three, the city assigned our PAB allocation in 2020 to Chaffa. Uh, Mr. Snow with any questions about the mall generally. And that's what I've got. 
things about can you can you say that first point again you cut out for a second uh the first point was that there uh, the ninety two thousand square foot at home uh, business has relocated to johnstown near highway 34 and i-25 uh, near the shields okay okay thank you no i didn't i didn't hear the fourth point either can you just say that one again I need to make a, a request for a better microphone, don't I? Uh, the number fourth, uh, the fourth point was um, Mr. Snow invited Commissioner Anderson to to contact him directly if she's got other questions uh, generally about the mall area. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Well, I will close the uh, public portion of this meeting and turn it back to the commission or staff to answer any questions. And Mr. Um, Vice Chair, just a question real fast. Did, was there input in the community meeting that wasn't shared with us today or, or was that? I had provided a summary um, okay. just in the staff report of what came up during the neighborhood meeting. And Kira, to, um, to Mrs. Mint's point, <clears throat> mm -hmm. Just to clarify, the increase in traffic would be a 10% increase over what is current. Um, Dylan might be better able to speak to that, yeah. Yeah, and the, the, that's where the CDOT permit would come in at a 20% increase, but we're sitting at a anticipated 10.1%. Okay, and Dylan, is there any, does the city have any, um, to, to Mrs. Mint's concerns, does the city have any uh, plans for redesigning that intersection, limiting on-street parking or anything like that? Uh, not at this moment. That's actually a CDAW intersection, uh, not a city okay. intersection, but I can um, talk with the city engineer, if, if, uh, the, the city traffic engineer, Ms. Mintz, if that would help uh, answer some of her questions. Okay. All right. Is there a uh, back exit down to 37th Road into Evans for some of that traffic? Or is that a roundabout way to get there? There is a second access point into the mall that is south of the liquor store that's directly adjacent to the southern parcel. Um, and then I do believe there are some other kind of roundabout ways that people could exit the site as you're suggesting. Thank you. I think you were talking about the neighborhood from 16th Avenue. So would 16th Avenue be able to empty to 11th Avenue via the old John Evans school site. It was true when John Evans was a school, you could do that kinda. Is that still true? Let me take a look at the map here real quick. I don't recall off the top of my head. <clears throat> that wouldn't help much if you wanted to go west from there. Yeah, it looks like they're there would be a way to get over to 11th Avenue still, but obviously- so that might help you turn, get, turn right, but or avoid the right turn from 17th Avenue, but it would not help you if you wanted to exit from the 16th Avenue neighborhood to go westbound on 34. You'd still run into yeah. that blocking of the intersection somehow. Yeah. That's been a problem since that whole construction, so. I'm yeah, I do know you could cut this. down to 30th Street, which goes all the way over to 23rd Avenue as right. another option. So, Yeah, then you'd have to turn left across traffic. That could be tricky, too. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions for staff? All right. Well, I'll turn it back to the commission for discussion and action. I do have the motion up. I can read it. Please. Um, Mr. Chair, I move that based on the application received and the preceding analysis, the planning commission finds that the proposed use by special review for a residential apartment complex in the commercial high intensity zone district is consistent with the development code criteria of section 24-480 and approves the use by special review. Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on that? 
Uh, I also uh, concur with um, Commissioner Franzen and that this is a creative use and a, a forward looking, um, I think well chosen place for the residential, especially with the, the bus stop as it ex is now. Um, I do share the concerns with the neighbors of traffic, but I think that we've just been lulled into uh, believing that traffic is not what it ought to be. And as it used to be when the mall was thriving, so that's unfortunate for the neighbors to have to go backward in time instead of forward. I would agree. I think that that's a really good point. I think that the, the, the use has been so um, tame for so many years and this is an exciting project for Greeley, so. Um, all right, Val, will you please call the vote? Guys, due to technical difficulties, I'll go ahead and take over with the vote. Um, we'll start with Chair Vice Chair Briscoe. Aye. Commissioner Anderson. Aye. Commissioner Franzen. Aye. Commissioner Maudlin. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Next up is a public hearing to consider a request for a preliminary PUD amendment to add all residential low density uses to area F and re relocate the required city park location from area F to areas L and M. The project is promontory preliminary PUD areas F, L, M, second am amendment. The case number is ZON 2021-0006. The applicant is Larry Buckendorf on behalf of Promontory Investments, LLC and Weld Co-Investors, LLC. The location is east of Promontory Parkway, south of 16th Street, and north of future 20th Street, and the presenter is Mr. Garrett. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman, uh, Vice Chairman Briscoe. Can you see my slides? Fine. Okay, great. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Commissioners, as well, Darrow. Uh, before you uh, is a request for a beauty amendment uh, for promontory. The subject side, we've talked about this proper project just recently, as two weeks ago. Uh, the property is in West Greeley, essentially north of 34 Bypass, east of the Promontory Parkway, and south of 16th Street, which is kind of this location. It's just south of the currently developed residential neighborhood. Um, you've seen this map, I know, recently, as two weeks ago. This is the Tri-Point 1999 zoning map. Uh, as I mentioned last time, these areas are, when it was zoned, these areas were all sub-zoned, so they have various land uses. Uh, the request before you is uh, to move the required parkland site from area F, which is kind of the Promontory Parkway and 16th Street, kind of that major arterial area, to more internal in the site itself. And then actually F would become uh, residential low and intensity uh, uses. Uh, again, this is zoom into the, the area, looking uh, just north of the uh, sites we talked about last week, or two weeks ago, I'm sorry. Um, so this area, larger area, about 99 acres in size. Uh, this is the allowed uses as of today. Uh, area F is, uh, has a park site that's to be get dedicated to the city. Uh, also, fire station schools locations were added in 2019. And area L&M have essentially residential with some lower commercial uses. And, of course, fire station schools and recreational uses were at, added in 2019 as well. Some site photos. This is looking south uh, from the property at 16th Street. You can see the fire station in the distance. This is looking from 17th Street. Uh, the roundabout looking west towards uh, JBS facilities. This is on 20th Street, a section that's complete basically to the entrance of the fire station, number six. And this photo on the, on the bottom of the slide is from 17th Avenue from Promontory Parkway looking north and west. You can see that the uh, intersections have been landscaped years ago. Uh, look at the zoning criteria. Uh, this property has uh, been undeveloped essentially since the project was developed in 99. Uh, so there's been no real development in this area. Uh, this proposal is for a community related uh, use, which would be a park site on the southern site. And you'll be seeing that request as part of a subdivision in a couple weeks as well. Um, when it comes to the other criteria in the code, uh, the staff found that it meant the other criteria, uh, specifically the comprehensive criteria that's outlined in the code as well. Uh, as for PD requirements, uh, the minimum is two acres. This is just under, uh, just over 99 acres in size and found that it met numerous criteria within the comprehensive plan. 
Uh, we did notify 36 property owners of the request within 500 feet. Uh, two signs were posted, one along 16th and one along Promontory Parkway, and we did not receive any citizen input. And staff is recommending the motion that's uh, before you on the slide. From there, uh, this does conclude staff's presentation. Uh, as outlined in the previous uh, proposals today, uh, we are following the same process uh, and I'm available for any questions. Thanks, Mike. Any questions for staff? Hey, Mike, what, what's the timeline for a light where this dumps into a 34 bypass? Uh, on the north side, then. Uh, I have not heard a direct timeline. It's, uh, uh, I guess the answer would be when warrants are met and they're not quite there yet to, you know, we'll need more development in that area to, to justify that. There is one by at the State Farm entrance off Promontory Parkway today, but there it, in the future there will be a light bill. Is that in conjunction with CDOT or will that be primarily just really CDOT? It'll be CDOT. So it's, it's, a, it's a cooperative discussion between CDOT and city basically looking at new tra traffic studies and new projects come along and kind of see when that warrant is met. There's various criteria to meet signal warrants. Uh, some of it is additional traffic, but then there's also the safety aspects of when that, that it has to be met as well. So at this point, it is, those warrants are not met yet. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? And the applicant is here, Commissioner. Okay. If the applicant is here, um, April, can you send an invite to the applicant? And if the applicant would state their name and address for the record. The applicant can actually unmute themselves as well as display their video if they would like to. Uh, April is not allowing me to start my video, but that's all right. I can be a black screen. Uh, my name is Morgan Kidder. Oh, there we go. Morgan Kidder, I work for Journey Homes. Uh, we are developing this site uh, with a use for a large central park as well as a number of single family homes. My address is 7251 West 20th Street, Suite L200 here in Greeley. Um, I don't have anything additional to add to Mike's presentation, just here and happy to answer any questions that the commissioners may have. Thank you. Any questions for the applicant? Uh, probably not at this time. Sounds like we're going to see this again in a couple of weeks for, um, for, I would say, a plot process. But uh, we're moving this park just in more interior just to um, have better front footage on on that road or, or what's the what's the end game there? Uh, Mike can answer that question for sure, uh, friends. And uh, they are looking to, in the, the plot you'll see, we'll have a relocated park site within it uh, from where it's at today. Um, obviously the park was never developed in the north, well, north, I'm sorry, the southeast corner there at 16th and Promontory Parkway and from functionality aspects and closest to a, a potential school site um, was desired to, to relocate the park from that. The original proof location back in if that makes sense. And it's more integrated in the neighborhood. And as I mentioned, no preview that we'll be talking about that a little bit more in a couple weeks. Okay, perfect. Thank you. A, a question for the applicant, and it may be premature since we'll see it come back. Will this be a similar uh, home construction as what we saw at the 95th and Sheep Draw? Uh, 83rd and Sheep Draw, perhaps. Yes. 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 It, it will be very similar to that subdivision at trails that she draw. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? All right. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you. All right. Uh, this is a public hearing and anyone wishing to speak can do so at this time. Please use the raise hand function in the bottom of the Zoom window. April, do we have anybody wishing to speak? At this time, I do not see anyone in live attendance to speak. We do not have any question and answers, chats, or emails in our CD admin bucket. Thank you. Thanks, April. All right, we'll close the public uh, hearing.
portion and uh, turn it back to the Planning Commission. I have the motion. Oh, sorry, go ahead. It's all you. Okay. Um, based on the application received in the project summary and accompanying analysis, the Planning Commission finds that the proposed amendment to the promontory, promontory preliminary PUD uh, areas F, L, and M meets the applic applicable development code criteria sections 24-625C3, A, B, F, G, and H, and section 24-663B1 and 2, and therefore recommends approval of the rezone to the city council. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Val is back online. Welcome back, Val. Please, Thank you. Please, Got please call for the vote. You gotta love technology, you know? In-person hearings can't come soon enough to suit me. Oh, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Vice Chair Briscoe? Aye. Commissioner Anderson? Aye. Commissioner Franzen? Aye. Commissioner Maudlin? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Item six is a public hearing to consider a request for a combined preliminary and final PUD to allow for an auto repair facility on approximately 0.59 acres. The project is Suffolk so, uh, Subdivision Fourth Filing First Amendment <coughs> preliminary and final PUD. Case number is PUD 2020-0013. The applicant is Elliot Smith of Terraform Companies LLC. The location is 2505 46th Avenue and the presenter is Ms. Stoller again. Thank you again for that introduction. Can you see my slides all right, Mr. Vice Chair? Thank you. Okay, as stated, this presentation is regarding a combined preliminary and final planned unit development within the Suffolk subdivision. Um, let's see if it all... There we go. Okay, so this slide provides an overview of the subject site and surrounding area. It is located directly south of Lowe's, north of Firestone, east of Goodwill, and west of the Goats Sports Bar. The property is surrounded by existing private drives to the north, west, and south, and 46th Avenue is situated directly to the east. This photo shows the subject site looking northeast from 46th Avenue in the existing private drive to the south. You can see Goodwill and Lowe's in the background here. The top photo on this slide shows the Firestone Auto Care to the south, and the bottom photo shows the Goat Sports Bar and Homewood Suites Hotel to the east across 46th Avenue. So the graphic shown on this slide showcases the area of the original Suffolk preliminary PUD. It encompassed a total of 38.48 acres of land and designated four lots and two outlots. Um, the corresponding plot for this was approved in 2004. The subject site was originally part of lot two, which is the area here and allowed for uses permitted in the CH zone district. This area has already been largely developed. Um, right to the east of 47th Avenue is the McDonald's. The Goodwill store is kind of in the center. And then the remaining chunk is what we're referencing now. The applicant is proposing to replat that remaining 2.16 acre parcel into two new lots and has submitted a combined preliminary and final PUD for an auto repair facility on the southern portion of the site. So here you can see that layout of the proposed replot. Um, the overall site is currently known as lot 2A of the Suffolk subdivision fourth filing. And the applicant is proposing to split that in two. Lot two here to the south would house the auto repair facility and lot one is to be developed at a later date. That would again require its own preliminary and final PUD approval and would still allow just the land uses permitted in the CH zone district. So here's the site plan. The applicant is proposing again the auto repair facility that would be accessed from the private drive to the south. There would be a total of nine parking spaces, 
as well as four bike stalls situated in, to the east of the building. The service space would be accessed on the west and exited on the east, utilizing the drive to the north of the building. Um, and you can see the approximate building setbacks are noted here for reference. Moving on to the landscaping, the applicant has designed the site to provide 42% open space. The landscaping would consist of 12 trees and over 100 shrubs and ornamental grasses. Additionally, there would be five freestanding light poles situated along the outer edge of the parking lot and access drives. So the building elevations are showcased here. The base of the building would be finished with a stone wainscoting, and above that would be APHIS. The building, again, is going to have three service bays and two customer entrances on the north or on the east and west sides of the structure. The proposed colors are going to be very similar to existing buildings in the surrounding area. So this slide, again, is the north and east elevations. And here are the south and west elevations. As a note, the signage shown on these plans is for illustrative purposes only and is going to require approval under a separate permit. So looking at the approval criteria for preliminary PUD, um, typically properties need to be at least two acres in size, which currently the total site is meeting this requirement. However, the applicant intends to replot the property into two parcels, each which would be less than that two acre size. However, staff feels because the subject site is already zoned PUD and the allowed uses have been established for both proposed lots, that this is still um, in line with the spirit of the code. The property also direct, or the project also directly aligns with a number of court comprehensive plan objectives noted here for reference. Various preliminary PUD approvals have encompassed the subject site in the past and the proposed land use of an auto repair facility is in conformance with these preceding plans. However, because no site development details were previously provided, a separate preliminary and final PUD were required to develop the property. Additional details regarding the proposed site design for the auto repair facility are outlined here. The required noticing was completed for this project and no citizen input was received. Therefore, staff recommends approval of the request and the suggested motion is shown for reference. And I'll be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Kira. Any questions for staff? Uh, I have a question. Um, what is the what is the rationale behind limiting auto repair in a commercial high intensity zone? Um, I'm not sure if I understand the question because are you saying that that that's the only use allowed on the property no, moving no, forward? I'm, or I'm saying that it requires a you. Why why do we need to necessarily? Okay, if I'm reading this right, the subject zone is already. Zoned PUD and prior approvals designated that the permitted land uses would be those allowed in the CH zone. And then it says auto repair is permitted and normally would require a design approval. But in this case, there's a PUD overlay. So the PUD trumps the yes. high intensity zone. Yeah. The PUD correct. specifically left out auto repair. It did not leave it out. Um, basically, the way the preliminary PUD was handled for the overall Suffolk subdivision previously was that it said certain areas could have uses allowed in a given zone district. However, in order to actually develop a site with um, a structure or whatnot, we needed to do a preliminary and final PUD approval for that specific property. Does that it. Yeah, it just it seems just strange to me this particular one uh, coming before us when there's uh, identical uses surrounding it. Um, I'm just wondering why. So why the we did a hearing on this today. Yeah, so basically it's because of the PUD zoning and our current PUD regulations. I think we've 
mentioned that with the code update, we're wanting to get to the point where once you get to more of the site specific details and how you're proposing a structure on the site, that that could in the future get handled via just a site plan process that would be administrative. But our current PUD regulations don't allow us to handle things in that fashion. Oh, so this is just a perfect segue to be talking about code updates. Yes. Well played. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions for staff? Um, is the applicant here, Kira? I believe they are. Okay. That's, yeah. If the applicant is uh, wishing to speak, they can do so at this time. Please state your name and address for the record. Can, can you hear me okay? Yep, can anyone can hear, hear me? You. Okay, all right, sorry about that. Uh, my name is Elliot Smith with Terraform Companies. Um, we are, the address is 6770 South, 900 East, uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, 84047. Uh, we're the ones developing this property for uh, Jiffy Lube. And I don't have anything to add to or take away from what Kira presented. Uh, but I'm happy to address any questions you might have, and thank you all for your time this afternoon. Any questions for the applicant? Okay, seeing none, um, we'll move on to the public hearing portion of the meeting. This is a public hearing. Anybody wishing to speak can do so at this time. April, do we have anybody that wants to speak? I do not see anyone in live attendance that would like to speak. I also don't see any emails. Okay, we'll close that portion of the hearing and turn it back to the commission for discussion and for some action. Uh, Mr. Chair, I have the motion. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move that uh, based on the project summary and accompanying analysis, the Planning Commission finds that the proposed com combined preliminary and final PUD for an auto repair site, auto repair use located at 2505 46th Avenue and a final plat and site plan for the Suffolk subdivision fourth filing first amendment is in compliance with the development code and therefore recommends approval to the city council. I'll second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion on this project? Hey, Val, will you please call the roll? Vice Chair Briscoe? Aye. Commissioner Anderson? Aye. Commissioner Franzen? Aye. Commissioner Maudlin? Aye. All right, motion carries. Next up is the staff report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In the interest of time, I will uh, defer to the next item. I do want to real quickly thank all of you uh, for being here. I know we've been asking a lot of the commission uh, with hearings, so uh, appreciate your time today. Thank you. All right. Looks like, Carol, you're up. I think that's why we're short on members today. Everybody saw that it was a 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. <laughs> <laughs> they all ran away. Um, so uh, we have a work session on the next um, chunk of our code update, um, our batch or whatever you want to call it, phase is probably the more um, appropriate term. So I'm going to share my screen and will you let me know if you can see the slides? Uh, hold on, you're seeing my calendar, which is not the right thing to be seeing, because then you would just cry if you saw my calendar. Okay. Are you seeing screen two? Yes. Are you seeing the, the yep. okay. So let's see if it's progressing properly. Are you seeing the slideshow? Yes. 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 Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much. We are excited to bring our next phase. This stuff's a little bit more exciting than chapters one and two, which is like the housekeeping section. Um, these still aren't the, the, the topics that we were talking about with our work sessions, but they're a little bit more, you know, planning stuff that we kind of all see with um, planning commission stuff that comes up like parking access and all of that. 
So here's our schedule. Um, still moving along. We're on the next grouping is access to parking, landscape, and site design signs. Um, and then, so we're here on June 8th. We're looking at a, a, a public hearing for June 8th for Planning Commission and then going to Council for first reading and public hearing in July. And then, of course, our September 21st will be our second reading for all of our code chapters coming together then with an effective date of October 1st. So these chapters are more technical in nature and um, staff has been working closely with the technical committee members. Uh, those are, that's um, internal department staff, um, subject matter experts throughout the city, as well as um, out, outside agencies, such as um, the, the Division of Wildlife, um, uh, Division of Natural Resources, sorry, uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife old school name was uh, Division of Wildlife. So you can, I've been doing this a while and sometimes I get the names mixed up. Um, we plan to bring all these chapters forward on June 8th. Um, and so you can see we're gonna be moving ahead. Our October 1st deadline um, is, is fast approaching and coming into summer and we're gonna have a busy summer, but it'll be great to have a new code in the last quarter of the year, so. Um, so chapter, as with chapters one and two, a section map has been included, along with all the draft code language for, for chapters seven, eight, and nine. Chapter seven um, includes regulations for access, circulation, parking, parking design, loading areas and recreational and oversized vehicles, as well as alternative access and parking options. So I kind of tried to distill all of that, uh, the 15 pages of uh, code section down into some key changes. Um, we're looking at triggers for bringing the parking into compliance and which areas of the, uh, specifically which areas of the site would need to be improved. Um, if, if you were just improving a small area of the site, you might not have to bring the whole site into conformance. And so we added some clarity and some uh, specifications and standards around that. We've also um, added clarity around the, um, if, you, if you're just doing a portion of the site, then you would only have to bring that portion into compliance for the parking. So you wouldn't have to right size it. Kind of really encouraging the um, infill development and looking at, um, you, know, comp, you know, keeping in mind our comp plan go goals and policies of, you know, infill. We've also clarified the, the criteria for parking maximums. We've revised the parking requirements based on broad categories rather than specific uses. And this would allow the code to remain flexible over time and you know, be able to ebb and flow as new uses and new ideas come into the marketplace. Um, we've also enhanced the parking reduction options and parameters for those reductions. We added a shared parking table um, a parking lot design table and move the parking lot landscaping from the landscape chapter to the parking section. So it would be easier for the developers to find um, all parking stuff contained in all the, uh, in the parking chapter. Um, landscape standards, the uh, section map and the draft of chapter eight has been in, provided in the staff report. Chapter eight includes sections related to landscape design, perimeter landscape and screening, as well as planting specifications. This chapter does not include any significant revisions as city staff recently updated the landscape code. The revisions centered around formatting, sorting, and regrouping the sections. Upon analysis, um, the, the consulting team and staff looked at the code again with fresh eyes and it was determined that the buffering and perimeter standards um, for landscaping were very similar and therefore we consolidated them into just perimeter landscape standards and a separate screening section. Um, so that it would be easier uh, for everyone to navigate rather than two tables that were very, had very similar things and when did they overlap and we took all of the ambiguity out and just created one table. Um, the, parking, the, the planning requirements for parking lots were um, moved from landscaping into chapter seven as previously mentioned. And we reduced the uh, berming requirements from 50% to 25% to better coordinate with the fence and wall berm credit that you get um, in the code. And it was established with the landscape code, but we right-sized that the berming requirements so that it was reflective of the bonus that you get if you add a fence or a wall. Um, chapter nine, our sign standards. Also, you got a section map in your packet and a draft of chapter nine was included with the staff report. 
And this chapter was only slightly revised with a few minor formatting changes, also similar grouping of sections together, trying to make it, you know, remove uh, redundancies and, you know, and clar added clarification and reorganizing the sections such as alternative compliance. And we made sure that it was clear the difference between alternative compliance and variances. We made sure that that was really clear and explained in the code. Sign measurement setback exemptions and pro exempt and prohibited signs, sign allowances and historic signage areas of the code were reorganized to better fit with the code, other code chapters, the format and um, kind of the, the whole layout of the regular of the other code sections that we've established in chapters one and two and um, the other sections we wanted to make sure that we were carrying that forward. And um, one, one change to note for the sign section. Um, we are proposing to allow electronic message display signs for institutional uses in residential zone districts subject to limited hours of operation. Um, we're proposing an hour of operation from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. since they are in a residential zone district, but out allowing that provision for a small EMD sign for churches, schools, um, other institutional uses. We have heard from the development community that's something that they were interested in. So we are proposing to, that is the one um, kind of significant change uh, for chapter nine. And a draft of chapter 10 was not provided, but there that was, that was thought that was intentional. Um, we did not include it because um, there were very, very small changes made again with just the formatting and um, the, the, the changes were very limited. This chapter will serve though as the single home for all the city's overlay areas and special districts. The minor changes were made such as reorganization and format, also just to make it match the overall code structure and format. Um, and then of course, uh, chapter 11 was not included with the staff report. And this chapter is also just a collection and resorting of supplemental standards that do apply citywide or for standards that apply to unique situations or involve use specific standards such as marijuana use, uh, marijuana regulations and uh, wireless regulations. So these are very specific, but they do apply citywide. So we kind of housed them all together, our oil and gas. Um, we did make one proposed revision um, other than our organization to language and format to match the overall code structure. Um, staff is proposing a 50 foot setback from plugged and abandoned oil facilities, oil and gas facilities, um, which was the practice, but wasn't um, implemented in the code. And so we've just wrapped that in there. It's something that um, FIRE has been um, requesting on applications for this plugged and abandoned um, uh, oil and gas facilities. So chapter 12 is gonna be the new home for Metro districts, but that will come to everyone in, at a future date. Um, moving that and resorting our Metro district regulations was gonna be um, you know, something that we wanna tackle later. Um, there's some stuff that we're, that's coming out of other jurisdictions that we kind of wanna look at and say, hey, you know, some other people are putting together modern you know, model codes and we'd like to kind of see what everyone is doing and move them out of where they live now, which is in a different section that has not ever been in the develop in our um, Title 18 or now Title 24 it's housed somewhere else in the municipal codes. So we want to move it over, um, but we want to kind of be thoughtful about it and see, you know, kind of what everyone else is doing with right sizing these um, metro districts and coming up with a good model code. Um, so that's pretty much in a nutshell. Uh, we covered all of that stuff in about 12 slides. I know it was a lightning round, but uh, it was really the just cleaning up, reorganizing and straightening it up, kind of like we Marie Kondo chapter seven through 12. <laughs> so with that, um, staff's available and Chris Brewster's with us as well. He was the mastermind behind the cleanup of, and, and reorganizing and sorting. He dumped everything out, like Marie Kondo says, put it on your bed, sort everything. Chris did that with our code and put everything in its right, rightful place. Thanks, Carol. I have a question about the oil and gas setback uh, for plugged and abandoned. What, uh, on that, I think right now, is there there is no setback is there there is no setback it was just a guidance that um fire was requesting um and we were we the you know people were willing to comply but we just really wanted to codify it and put it in the code 
have we, and I understand that. And I think my understanding of that issue is not necessarily from a, well, and I don't want to speak out of turn here, but, but in, in rare circumstances, a plugged and abandoned well has to, has to be replugged. Is that correct? Wow, um, I'm going to ask Brad to help me out with this because oil and gas has never been my forte in my planning career, and Brad is our master expert. Well, and that's fine. Brad, you and I have talked about this before. I think my only question here is I'm just trying to understand how this impacts mm -hmm. development because we've got a lot of sort of the, the checkerboard. Um, Correct. You know, yeah, I'm happy to answer uh, that. I'm happy to answer that, Commissioner. So, um, Plug it and abandoned wells um, are, are a good thing, typically because they are allowing the oil and gas to be accessed in a more consolidated well somewhere else. And it, it um, means that the larger setbacks around that oil and gas um, well site that essentially have been sterilized from surface use, if you will, um, which can be as much as several acres in land are, are now gone. In some cases, though, to your point, Commissioner, a plugged and abandoned well may need to be re-drilled over time. Um, and we've seen that especially recently when um, somebody has done a multi-well site within, say, a quarter mile or a half mile or even a mile. Um, the state is requiring some of the older wells that have been plugged and abandoned to be re-drilled to firm up the casing um, so that they don't leak and create transmission of, of oil from the, from the bottom hole up. Um, essentially, it's just a best practice to have a little bit of wiggle room about around a plugged well site so that if that very un, unlikely event happens, it's physically possible. Right now, uh, for example, the King Supers on 71st Avenue is located on top of a, a plugged well. It happens to be in the freezer department. So that um, that would be a big problem if they ever had to redrill that. They'd have to kind of try to thread the needle from an angle, which is very, very difficult. Um, so this just avoids it. It's a recommendation of our fire department that uh, planning supports, and it's a, it's a best practice in the state. So this would just codify it. We're not, a, uh, the oil and gas companies um, don't have concerns with it. And do you guys have any, I know the oil and gas companies don't have any concerns, but just in terms of the viability or the surface use of a site, King Supers being an example, had there been a setback there, does that, I mean, I, I'm not articulating myself well, Brad. But no, I think I, I know where you're going with that. Does it have unintended consequences? Yeah. Um, you know, this would not prohibit there from being landscaping or parking lots or any of those other time, types of things. It's really just designed to make sure there's not a, building on top of it. And if, if it really came down to it, you know, being a, a site constraint, um, I'm, there would be an opportunity to, to, you know, talk with the oil and gas company about alternatives. Any other questions? Carol, could we uh, circle back to chapter seven? Yes, sir. Um, this is a question for myself, and I think some of the other commissioners have it kind of the same question. Since we started dealing with the Richmark uh, construction on the patties and stuff and infilling, every time we do, we tend to bring up the parking requirements and we seem to be giving away the requirement to have off-site or on-site parking. And we end up using some of the city's street parking to accommodate this or we reduce the requirement for parking I've read through chapter seven as much as I can understand. My question to you is, are we going to be going down the same path as we look for infilling and stuff, or will we be cleaning up the requirements to have more on-site parking as these buildings come up before us for development? I think with the revisions, we're kind of capturing the practices that we've been doing, but we also added some incentives um, I think there was some, there's some code language in there and Chris, you can better phrase it than I can um, about if there's a, if there's city parking, structured parking, they can get some bonuses, a credit for it. So we're kind of trying to um, kind of almost not push the issue, but um, bring it to the forefront that we, you know, hey, there's, we, 
you get some incentives for doing some, you know, structured parking or, you know, common parking areas, you know, so maybe, you know, that could be an opportunity for developers to look at. Um, we're, we're really just um, more putting parameters around when we do the alternative parking or parking reduction. We're saying, hey, we have some parameters now around shared parking. We have some parameters now if you're going to reduce the parking um, for um, we're adding some provisions for bicycle or transit. So we're, we're kind of making the box, you know, more square and, and defined rather than just, a, a, you know, hey, you can reduce your parking. We're putting actual um, structure around it. So it, it may not address all of the parking, but at least now we have parameters and we kind of know, you know, where we're going with it. Does that kind of sum it up, Chris, in a really bad way of saying it? Because you're way better. Yeah, I think I, I would just, I think <laughs> I understand the, the gist of the question. So I would hit it at three levels. I think from a general citywide policy, we are headed in a direction where parking would be more flexible to the context. And then that the more you share parking, however you do so, um, so that we don't require as much on-site where it's not needed um, is what, what we want to do. Um, so at the next level to accomplish that, we have added more opportunities for parking reductions or at least more um, specific ones. Your code has a lot of them already, but we kind of tried to identify them specifically. So there are more opportunities to, if you're concerned with not enough site parking, um, what's in chapter seven does present more opportunities for them to reduce it. However, in doing so, um, it does put some parameters on it, as Carol mentioned, so that we can better monitor it so it, it doesn't present a parking problem. Um, and then the third level to your specific question on, um, are we allowing people to use on-street parking and count it to the requirement? Um, we, we are, there's a credit in there for on-street parking can count to a certain um, percentage of your, your requirement. Um, we hadn't heard that that practice had been a problem and we generally look at it as a, as a best practice so that you don't um, have too many large surface lots throughout the city. But if it's a concern from the commission, you know, that's something we can look at. This is our work session, our chance to work through the regulations. So if that's a concern, that's why we bring this forward to you. And it's, sometimes it's easier for you to see the text and comment on it than vague ideas. So. Yeah, I guess my, my concern, Carol, is that as we get more density in the downtown area itself and start to do more infilling, at what point in time is the city gonna be required to put in a parking structure or mm -hmm. have developers contribute to a fund that offsets the cost to the city for that uh, very feature? At some point in time, that has to be addressed and I don't yeah. know when that level is, but it needs to either have, if they don't meet the off-street parking requirements, a cash in lieu that goes into some sort of fund for providing for a multi-level parking structure seems to be appropriate as that density increases. Commissioner, um, I can add to that. Uh, when the downtown parking study was done a number of years ago, four or five, there had been some level of anticipation that it would conclude that a parking garage would be needed or garage is. In fact, it, uh, the finding was that there were, is both enough parking and also um, would be the case for quite a while. It was really an issue of both management of the existing parking and signage. The management uh, has been improved through uh, new tracking software and new policies about parking and, and the parking um, lots and that type of thing. That doesn't uh, negate the need for a garage uh, to your point. Um, however, I think it's safe to say that the city recognizes that that will need to be a shared um, effort at some point in the, in the, at this point, somewhat longer future. And, and really it, it's kind of a product of the success of the things that this placemaking and design set of codes is designed to do. Um, I think we would be hesitant to recommend, um, you know, doing a, a carrot and a stick at the same time by trying to offer and you know a uh, code that is incentivizing that, but then backdoor that with fees and such, I think that's probably a conversation for a later date. Um, but uh, the overall goal here is to really recognize that um, to, in order to create the kind of placemaking and urban environment that's envisioned, uh, we need to use the resources that exist in terms of existing parking, and then be a little bit on the cutting edge of of 
the demand need and then and then and then resolve the demand need. So I, I would submit to you, Commissioner, that that's really the effort of the code that's in front of you at this point. Um, and, and it's not uh, with a blindness towards that eventual need or uh, situation, but rather that will be the happy consequence of um, the types of outcomes that we're hoping come with this update. Thanks. Anybody else? Um, I had a, a quick question about the signs mm -hmm. um, regarding the, the signs and, and landscaping simultaneously. And um, I was thinking about the last time that I was in Fort Collins uh, trying to find a, a store. Um, I, had the, I had the address, but I couldn't see across the parking lot to see the parapet signs because the trees were so lovely and beautiful that they completely <laughs> obscured every last sign. So um, I had to drive around in the parking lot, uh, right up next, close to the buildings where I could not see the signs either. And um, I was wondering if, if that had been considered with the combination of the, the landscape code and so many trees proposed in the islands of parking lots, and then the relatively <laughs> limited signage up on parapets, and then with monument signs uh, out toward the street, with what square footage is left over, there's not much room for a visible sign and certainly not for a location within a development. So I was wondering, how can we marry all those three things together so that business owners who go to the trouble of putting up a sign will still be able to see it when they've gone to the trouble of putting in landscaping? That is a good question. And that did come up with our landscape group too. Um, and I think they even brought up some situations in Fort Collins as well. Um, the, what we've done is by reducing the, by merging the buffering and the perimeter landscaping together um, and um, giving, looking at a more of a tree count based on number of spaces, we've given them some more options to move stuff around and shuffle it. Wouldn't you say, Chris, where they, if they needed to move some things around so you could still see the signs, it's not as prescriptive um, and so I think that that's kind of the goal of what we were trying to do, but Chris can speak a little bit more to that, but I think that's spot on with what we were talking about. Yeah, I think that's true, Carol, that um, some of the flexibility in the location um, can help. I also think um, what you mentioned, commissioners, it's a pretty site-specific problem and issue. I don't think we have so much landscaping that we would walk into that problem um, for two reasons. One, the flexibility Carol mentioned um, but two, we have treated the, the frontages um, a bit differently, and that's usually where you have a sign issue. So if, it's a, if the buildings are set back where the parking lot landscaping could be um, obscuring signage on the building, um, that to us is probably a site-specific design issue, and I think the flexibility could address it. To the extent we bring things closer to the street in the placemaking um, realm, that's where we usually hear this issue raised the most. And um, we address it by, it's, um, I think it's a, a time issue. Um, so, so at some point you want those tall trees, which we're specifying as the streetscape to become it. That's the landscaping. And that canopy usually should rise above that store level storefront so that they're, they're seen. So it's the closer to the street, the less ground cover we want and the more we want a larger tree canopy. So there is some, because we've addressed it on a frontage basis, there is some reduction in the landscaping that's required on the front. Um, to the point that you, of the experience you had in Fort Collins, I think that's more of a, um, the site specific design probably did that. And I think with your code and your requirements, um, laying things out in a way that we have the taller trees in there and we aren't putting the, you know, the evergreens and parking lot islands and they're shifted to the, the buffers rather than the, the view of the businesses, I think um, would, would result in better better results for that. Yeah, I think I think maybe in, in another 15, 20 years, th that'll be fine. But in the intervening time, it just seems really rough on the businesses that you just simply can't see their signs. So, oh well, as long as, but I do like the opportunity for, for flexibility. And if we've got that written in there and mm -hmm. it's not quite so prescriptive, that will be a big help. Anything for flexibility, I'm, I'm on board. 
Yeah, and the other overarching thing we're starting as as these the more design oriented drafts come out, um, we're starting to coordinate. You know, your code currently has, and, and you even heard it in some of today's applications, the alternative compliance provisions, um, and so we're building some structure for that as well. Um, so there will always be opportunities for that as well um, on these. And with alternative compliance, there's always an opportunity to, to appeal to a hearing. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Yep, it will be done. Um, what chapter, um, the first two chapters came forward with alternative compliance, that it would be done at an administrative level, but al always that provision to call up to the Planning Commission. Okay, thank you. Okay. Oh, I'll email you with a um, a tiny typo I found. Oh, I found a couple too, so we can. Uh, I'll I'll add yours, and we'll make sure we try to capture them in um, the the draft that goes forward. Okay, yeah, um, it was another one of those where it's actually a word. Uh, it's just the wrong word. So. Oh, I found signs sense. were spelled sings, so it was cool. Yeah, it was very sings, happy and musical and happy. So just you know, there's lots of words and lots of opportunity to get a word of uh, letter flip flop. So. But I'm glad you're looking and reading, and um, I, I think I think the organization and even just the table of contents. So one of the things when we first started working with Chris is he said, if I can get you a good usable table of contents, that's going to be like half the battle right there. And if you can see how it's organized and the groupings and the numbering, it just starts seeming to make more sense and just putting stuff where it kind of belongs. I think it's just that's gonna be a great help. So I hope you guys are seeing that theme carry through with clear intent statements and following the same rhythm and of the code. And It's much more usable to find what you're after. Just even in looking through the draft when I couldn't remember where something was and I hadn't highlighted it, I could find it right away without too much trouble. So. Well, that's good. That's well, make a note of that, that it's already <laughs> proving to be user-friendly. Great work, guys. I can, I mean, the, the amount of time you're spending on putting into this is, is mind boggling to me when I can barely make a two, one o'clock meeting on a Tuesday. So just keep up the good work. <laughs> well, we're just glad you were able to, so we could keep everything moving along. <laughs> okay. And, and if you guys have any questions, you know, reach out to me. Uh, you guys have my email. You know how to get me through the development code update. Um, email address, just reach out to me. Um, I know Commissioner Anderson has sent me some stuff. And if you guys have any questions, you want me to further explain it at the hearing, you, you know, I'll, I'll, of course, explain it to everyone and the public as well. But, you know, please send me your questions, comments as you see it um, come forward, um, even especially when we get into the other chapters, because they're going to be new and improved and some of them are going to look completely different. And that's what we really had our work sessions on. So future coming at you soon will be um, chapters three through six. And those are going to be the stuff we worked on with the work sessions, our placemaking, our missing middle. And so those are going to look completely different and new in some areas. So please reach out to me if you have questions, you need more information. You know, we can always have another work session. You know, if they we're having, we have, we have two tentatively planned for those chapters, but if you need additional information or want me to explain something in the second one after the first one, please reach out. Great, thanks, Carol. Brad, I saw you pop on. Do you have something else for us? No, it just sounded like you were wrapping up, and I wanted to thank everybody again, but I may have been a little ahead of myself. Oh, okay. Well, I'm wrapping up. So <laughs> we appreciate it.